Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In the early hours of this day, July 2nd, in the year 1918, Solomon Washington Gladden breathed his last breath and passed to eternal life. He was 82 years old at the time of his death, having served as our senior minister from 1882 to 1914, as our senior minister emeritus then from 1914 to 1918. At his bedside was found his favorite poem. Tonight I lay my burdens by as one who rests beside the road, and for his wearied back unbinds the whelming road, load. I kneel beside the hidden pools of prayer, still waters fraught with healing power. In God's green pasture, I abide this long-awaited hour. I know that day must bid my face courageously my task again, serving with steady hand and heart my fellow men, to hold my sorrow in the dark, to fight my fear, to hide my pain, and never for one hour to dream the toil in vain. This be tomorrow, now tonight. Great pitying Father, I would be forgiven, uplifted, loved, renewed, and always alone with thee. The voice of the prophet of the social gospel was stilled, and his eternal light began to shine. A little over seven months earlier, during the last week of November 1917, Solomon Washington Gladden had a serious stroke that left him paralyzed on the right side. So he spent the next months through the winter of 1917 and into the spring of 1918 teaching himself to type with his left hand. He never stopped creating. He never stopped writing. He wrote monthly poems and hymns for the congregation throughout the spring of 1918, which were published as calendar verses. We just sang, or we're about to sing, actually, later, the last hymn he ever wrote. He also continued to write letters to President Wilson and others calling for an end to World War I. He never stopped fighting for peace. He finally returned to worship one last time, one last Easter service on March 31st to hear the new senior minister preach. At his funeral, that new senior minister, Dr. Irving Maurer, who had only arrived in January 1918 from Northampton, Massachusetts, shared the story of riding with Dr. Gladden in his car through Franklin Park in the spring of that year. As they rode along, Dr. Gladden would point out where members of the church lived and where his friends lived, and the best he could through his broken speech, tell Dr. Maurer about their lives. On the ride, Dr. Maurer asked Dr. Gladden about his ability to speak out on issues of social justice. He said, how could you have done it so long and so well? And Gladden responded, it was the hardest thing I did to speak out on social injustice in our city and in the world Every time I spoke, it took something out of me. But every time I was silent, I could hear the voices of those who had no voices crying out for help. So I would speak again. My silence was killing those who had no one to speak for them. On June 28th, having completed his final writing project, an article for, a women's, for the Women's Home Journal for those women whose husbands were fighting in the war or who were widowed because of the war, he was demanding equal pay for the work they were doing in the war effort and demanding that they receive full pension for the loss of their spouse. His left hand typed out the last words, and then the hands of the father of the social gospel rested from his labors. That evening, he went riding around Columbus one last time, 
with John Preston, his African-American coachman and dear friend, in, and hang on to this, in an electric automobile that, wait, wait for it, that the church had given him as a gift in 1950. Not saying that what is done once should never be done again. <laughs> the very next morning, Saturday, June 29th, he had a second stroke that left him unconscious, though without pain. His sons Fred and George traveled from the east to join his, their sister Alice and their only granddaughter, also Alice, or Baby, as Dr. Gladden called her, and they gathered at his bedside one final time. On Monday, July 1st, the Ohio State Journal had a headline that read across the top of the paper, Reverend Dr. Washington Gladden is dying. Imagine that. The headline of the paper announcing that he was on his deathbed. Never again regaining consciousness, he died early on Tuesday the 2nd. That night, the Columbus Evening Dispatch announced Columbus's first citizen has died. His death, wrote President Wilson, Wilson that very day to the family, his death has impoverished us all. Headlines across the country hailed his memory. People of all religions filed by his coffin for more than two hours the day of his funeral, at which America's leading rabbi, Rabbi Stephen Wise, joined other faith leaders from across all denominations and religious expression to speak at his funeral. His coffin was escorted out of First Church, which was then on Capitol Square, across from the Capitol. His coffin was escorted from there by hundreds of clergymen who walked beside the coffin to Green Lawn Cemetery to honor him and escort him in honor. As they went, the bells of Trinity Episcopal Church, the only other church on Capitol Square, played all of Dr. Gladden's favorite hymns for the assembled mourners outside of 74 East Broad Street. And they all joined together singing because they all knew the words by heart, O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. He would be laid to rest next to his wife, Jenny, and his daughter, Helen, at Green Lawn, and later Alice, Fred, and George. Ten years ago, the Episcopal Church set aside this day as a saint's day for Washington Gladden. And I might remind everyone, he did spend one day of his life in the Episcopal Church. So I love the fact that they honored him this way, along with Walter Rauschen Bush and Jacob Rees, the great photographer of the poverty encountered in New York City. They call this day in the Episcopal Church the Day of Prophetic Witness. So in that spirit, what, what was it that made Solomon Washington Gladden a saint of the church? What made him the person that was set apart this way? Was it his 40 books? Perhaps his 35 honorary doctorates? And I might remind you, he never had a degree from a theological seminary for a master of divinity. He never was trained to be a pastor. There's something to be said for that, <laughs> I'm telling you. Was it his 58 years in parish ministry, 36 of which were spent at this very pulpit that you're seeing today on Capitol Square? Was it his undying defense and advocacy for all people, for justice and peace? Was it his fearless advocacy for the poor, those who were forgotten and forsaken, those who were left out and left behind? Well, all of this helped. But in my mind, it was one singular and extraordinary thing about Dr. Gladden that set him apart as a saint of the church. It was this. He grasped something that was only dimly sensed by others in his day. It was simply that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not intended merely for the salvation of individuals, but also for the transformation of society. Nothing more, nothing less. Now that may sound astounding that at the turn of the 20th century that was a thing, but it was. This is often referred to as the social gospel. He dedicated his life to this singular belief. He applied his beliefs in church and society. And as a result, he made a world of difference for the world around him. He didn't just hold these thoughts to himself. He preached them 
He lived them. He wrote books and journal articles around which they focused. He started an entire movement that spread from this pulpit across the world. And that's why many called him the father of the social gospel movement. For those who come from a Catholic tradition, it was also wedded with the Catholic worker tradition. So it was a whole system of Christians coming together. The social gospel movement, which Walter Rauschenbusch and Washington Gladden wrote about and lit a fire under, is no less than the truth of Jesus Christ, the law of Israel, and the crying blast of the prophets coming together to say, you must care for my poor. The social gospel movement was a movement that grew out of the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. It was a movement in which salvation was seen, as I said, as a, in a symbiotic relationship between the personal and the social. One could never separate one's personal salvation from the salvation of the world. They were together. And the development of the social gospel and our new social gospel blossoming in these times will be the focus of a sermon series in just f four weeks that Reverend Samuelson and I will do. So I'll save all the roots and shoot stories for then. But I do want to say this as I come close to the end. Washington Gladden arrived in Columbus in December 1882. His first sermon was preached from this pulpit on Christmas Eve that year. He preached, he preached in this pulpit for many thousands of sermons over many, many years. He was an unapologetic evangelical liberal, biblically grounded, scripturally centered, and he lived and died with the belief that we always need to adjust Christianity to meet the needs of the modern times. Here are some of his beliefs. And I want to share, about 20 years ago, I wrote an article for the Columbus Dispatch in which I shared Dr. Gladden's beliefs. And I was skewered by all sorts of folks on the right who called me a heretic of the gospel. And I thought to myself, I'm just quoting him. Just listen to wait till you hear this though, right? And these ideas were 90 years old when I wrote them and shared them, right? Here are some of these beliefs. He spoke of moral evolution, meaning we need to get away from being troubled by original sin and deal with the sins of our current times. On atonement, he said, Christ bore our sins in fellowship with us, not in substitution for us. And the creeds, he said, should not be tests of faith, Rather, we should live our personal testimonies of faith that demonstrate our abilities to care for every fellow human being. He did not see Jesus as the founder of a religious system, but simply the very revelation to God, of God to humanity of what the living God looks like, what life in God looks like, and what a relationship with God should be like. Gladden placed great emphasis on Jesus' ethical teachings as central and normative to Christian faith and experience. And the Sermon on the Mount was at the center of all his teachings as the way to live a Christian life. Gladden also believed that Christianity was not the only way to God, that all religions found a way to God and showed us a way to God. However, he felt in his mind, Christ was the head of the body of humanity and we should pay attention to the way he guides us to love God and one another. As many of you know, I could talk about Dr. Gladden all day, and for those who serve on the staff of First Church, they've actually heard me do it. But what has driven me to bring this word to you today is simply this. He was ours. He was our pastor. He was our prophet. He belonged to us. He came from us. He was a part of us and we are a part of him. On this day, his 105th anniversary of his Saints Day, which is his coming home to God eternally. Let me finish with these thoughts. Above us, here in the west transept, we have the Gladden window, and in the window stand two very tall figures. I want to say 15 feet, maybe tall, um, bigger than any NBA players, even the new guy from France. <laughs> 15 feet, and one is charity and one is justice. Charity holds a cornucopia symbolizing generosity and compassion and mercy, and justice holds a sword, one of the biggest swords I've seen anywhere, quite frankly, symbolizing righteousness 
and justice. We're reminded each week by these windows to live with charity and justice, mercy and justice, side by side, calling us to feed the hungry and to do justice, and also calling us to change the world so there are no more hungry in the world. On this day, let us remember our brother in Christ, our friend on the journey, our pastor, and our ever-crying witness to charity and justice. Although he never really used the name Solomon, I call him Saint Solomon because that was his baptized name. Saint Solomon Washington Gladden. Let us also remember that the social gospel movement belongs to us, and we're called to live it out. Inspired by Jesus and Washington, I pray that you will discover your gifts to speak out, to act out for what is just and right in this world. I pray that you will speak out and act out of your experience to alleviate the suffering of others. And I pray that you will live your faith as we are called to live a gospel of justice. Amen.